There are also children who are in illegal uh, uh, schools and correctional homes. There are also those who are in certain prayer homes and dormitories. And those who transmigrate across the Sahara, as well as the Mediterranean, to Europe. So the issue of out-of-school children has a subcontinental and a continental or intercontinental component. So it's very important we understand that because even as we work hard to take care of that problem in Nigeria, other countries where similar practices happen, like Niger, uh, Cameroon, even Ghana and Senegal, we may have some influx. These issues are fundamental to human capital development. It's not only the issue of Almadiri or the out-of-school, it's about human capital development. These out-of-school children contribute to the very low numbers of human capital indices of this great nation. Poor health infrastructure or poor health services, poor education, retention, enrollment, or transition of children or school in schools, issues of water and sanitation, issues that have to do with housing, issues that have to do with, uh, to do with malnutrition, and even corruption. So if we do not take care of these children, as Mr. Speaker once said in his opening speech when we resume, their collective fate is also sealed with the fate of our nation. Mr. Speaker, these children are innocent, a lot of them, and it's a factor of failure of society in taking care of them. We will need a united effort across all boards, the executive, the legislature, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the, the judiciary and the general public to do what we can to once and for all move for action because it's time for action as said in the documentary. Mr. Speaker also made a very important statement in his speech where he said this is time for truth telling. It's not a time for finger pointing or a time for stereotyping or pushing the box. We know the problems of this out of school and particularly I'm arguing from the Northwest where I come from. The Northwest is blessed, of course, and I believe we have the capacity to do a lot in taking care of these children. The Northwest has been a landlocked region. We have seven states, Mr. Speaker, seven governors, seven deputy governors, seven speakers, seven deputy speakers. We have 95 House of Rep members in this House of Chambers. We have 21 senators. Mr. Speaker, we have thousands of uh, judicial officers. We have thousands of lawyers in this region. We also have thousands of royalties, traditional leaders, and title holders. We have thousands of businessmen. We have thousands of clergy. We have thousands of clergies as well as clerics who are all deeply knowledgeable about this matter. We have a million millionaires and a thousand billionaires. We have an absolute young population. The average population of Nigeria at the mean age is around 25, some say 35. But for the Northwest, Mr. Speaker, it is 19. It's a huge demography that if we don't do something about this, it's all going to consume a lot of us. People have been saying it's a ticking time bomb. No, that bomb that is ticking has already exploded. What we have now, Mr. Speaker, is a ticking hydrogen bomb, locked and loaded. Unless we are able to do something about this out of school children, we will definitely have a bleak future, uh, future for our great nation. What we are saying for the case of Almadiri is, of course, there is an ideological and historical background to it. We should spice them up with skills, vocational skills, technical skills, and entrepreneurship. So teach them little English that they can understand and communicate in their businesses. Some Arabic and some Chinese probably, and arithmetic. Even for a poll that we just conducted, the greater majority of Nigerians believe that they should be taught entrepreneurship, vocational skills, technical skills, and many others. I really want to thank my honorable colleagues and Mr. Speaker for giving me the opportunity. And lastly, I want to thank all our leaders who have put their heads together, our traditional leaders, the leadership of the House, and our governors in various states that have taken action uh, in, in taking care of this emerging problem. And once again, thank Mr. Speaker for organizing the delegation that came from my state. They also came from other states, from Kano, from Zaria, from Kaduna, from Kebi, from Donfara, all of them for the spirit of Marjorie uh, and, and, and finding a solution to this problem. My name is Mohamed Tai Munguno. I represent Marke Munguno Ngenze, Federal Constituency of Borno State. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Members, it is beyond question that education 
to the bedrock of any developmental aspiration. And as such, we should do everything possible to make sure that education is accessible to all and sundry in this country. While clamoring and championing for enrollment of our children to school, we should also pay attention to retention. Because one of the fundamental gaps of policy in our educational system is the issue of retention after enrollment. Let me give you my own personal example, Mr. Speaker, while I was school, my own personal example. I am from a poor background, but because of the fact that during our days, the school, government gives us food. Government closes us while in school. Mr. Speaker, around members, the quality of food that I eat in school is better than the quality of food that I eat at home. Therefore, whenever we are going on holiday, I am sad because I am missing that food. While, whenever we are coming back to school, in fact, I am counting the days when we are going to resume because of the quality of food that I get to school. All these things are not there now. So one of the major things that government is supposed to do is to extend this school feeding program to all the nooks and crannies of this country. At least children that are in primary school and in the first three years of secondary school should enjoy this pre qualitative meal as a means of retaining them in school. And then again, Mr. Speaker, I also thank you for sponsoring a bill of removing education from the fundamental objectives and directive principle of state policy and then take it to fundamental human rights so that it can be justiciable and can be enforceable in court. So once we do these two things, we will go a long way in correcting the anomaly in our educational system and then the 13.2 million children that are out, is out of school will be a thing of history. Thank you. Al-Hassan Ado Dogua is my name. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I represent the good people of Dogua, Chudu Wada, federal constituency. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, I'm from Kano State. Certainly, I may have some sentiments as to call the subject matter today, al -Majiri. But thank God, in the course of your opening remarks, you said it's a matter to do with out-of-school children. This is more comprehensive. This is more, more encompassing. And it, it permits me now to say that today, on the floor of the Green Chambers of the House of Representatives, Mr. Speaker, we are discussing that perennial problem that when you go to Kano, on the streets of Kano, you see the al as we call them there, begging, not attending to the Islamic scheme of their education, what they were out for. This is out of school children. Mr. Speaker, it is my belief that when you go to the north, northeast, in Medjugorje, Diobe, Adama, or some of that entangled, problem, uh, entangled areas that have problems to do with insurgency, the insurgents were also the product of school dropout because they decided not to go to school to be usable to the nation and in the end they become problem to the nation. Mr. Speaker, I put it to you that in Lagos where you call the area boys, most of them are people who decided not to go to school. And in the end they become area boys. Some of them grew, grow to the extent of being area fathers. It's unfortunate. It is out of school kids. Mr. Speaker, the matter we are discussing here today includes the child that decided not to go to school in Inugu and just decided to go to the mining area to mine without education. That is a case of an out-of-school child. So we are discussing a matter that is not only peculiar to the North today, we are discussing a matter that is not only germane, it is all-encompassing and all-inclusive. It is a colossal problem to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Each and every one of us must stand on his feet today to add value to this debate and to make sure that we put the government also on its toes. Thank Honorable Yusuf Gadi, the very vibrant member from the plateau. One of your own guys, Mr. Speaker, the Inner Caucus members of the Vajra Project. Tagardi, I, I, I commend you. This is a case that we must have to look inward and out, in and out. 
What do we have to do as members of the House of Representatives? Because we occupy a component of the Nigerian government. And when you are talking of good governance, legislation cannot be ruled out. What do we do as collect collectively as an institution? What do we do individually at home? Is it only giving uh, money to buy colonel or buy assist people who are going for bath? What do you call naming ceremonies? We give money, to, we, we, give, we pay for their dowries to marry? What do you do after that? We must ask ourselves this question. And we must also ask the other arms of government, that, especially the executive, that what are they actually doing about education in Nigeria? He has succeeded in creating a link, very realistic link, connection, connectivity between the problems of education and the current perennial insecurity problem we face as a country. And it has been very well put. I thank Gandhi for that submission, and I want to say that I concur with him that today we must rise to our responsibility. The House must continue to look at these openings and see how we can bring this thing to a complete stop. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, education, to the best of my understanding, not only as a legislator, with my little education of the Nigerian Constitution, is a concurrent matter. A matter that has fallen in the hands of the state governors and has also fallen, in part, in the hands of the centre, especially in the area of tertiary education. Even though the debate we are undertaking today may have more concern to do with basic education because we are talking about the Nigerian child. But subsequently, education is education and they are interconnected. When you have a good foundation, Mr. Speaker, you move forward. And the tertiary education we grant to our children in the country will also have something to bear. I want to urge Nigerian governors, the powerful governors of the Federation, the almighty governors in court, that this is one challenge. This is one challenge that they must also keep to their responsibility too. This is one major challenge that will, be, will have to be addressed at the level of state government to provide good governance. But unless this thing is addressed, the Nigerian state and our people will continue to be in shambles because education is in the first place undermined. I must in, the, for in the second place, Mr. Speaker, I must commend those states who have already taken bold steps to address this problem. My governor, the governor of Kano State, Dr. Abdullah Umar Ganduja, Kadimul Islam, has set the pace rolling, the ball rolling. He has enacted a law which has been signed into law that this al system must not be abused, even though it has some moral and historical implications that we all cherish. But the way it's been done in the north and in the cities of Kano, or in the, city, in the streets of Kano State, is not even in the best intentions of the, of the, of the, of the initiators of such schemes. My governor has enacted a law today that no al should be seen around Gida Murtala begging in the hours of school when he was supposed to be in school, of course, before his mother. No al should be seen in Sabangari Market or Kantin Kwari uh, offloading or uh, offloading or offloading or offloading mortgages for market traders. They are not there for that. It's an abuse of the al system. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know the governor of Nasarawa State. The governor of Nasarawa State. The governor of Nasarawa State. Honorable colleagues, honorable colleagues, this is a serious matter. Everybody here that wants to speak will speak. We will we'll stick to time. Unfortunately, the timekeeper was not around, and you are not the timekeepers. So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'll start by saying that one in every five out of school children in the world is in Nigeria. One in every five out of school children in the world is in Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, with 13.2 million people out of school in Nigeria, Nigeria has the highest number of out-of-school children. And unfortunately, all in, unfortunately, most in the North, East, and the Northwest. But Mr. Speaker, I'd like to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the issue of the Almagiri. The word Almagiri, Mr. Speaker, is derived from an Arabic word al muhajirun which means a seeker of knowledge, Islamic knowledge. Unfortunately, a lot of people mistake it to 
means that it is somebody that goes out to beg. It means a seeker of knowledge, Islamic knowledge. Now, why I'm talking about the Almaty issue, Mr. Speaker, a 2014 UNICEF report clearly states that 9.5 million out of the 13.2 million out of school children are Almaty, which means 72%, 72% of that 13.2 million children that are out of school are Almaty. And this is very, very unfortunate, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a lot of us benefited from free education and scholarship. Some of us that are young might have not benefited within this chamber, but their parents too benefited. Mr. Speaker, our past and present leaders benefited from free education, free scholarship. But unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, why is it that we cannot give back what we have? Mr. Speaker, we put a lot of money in infrastructure, in building roads and bridges. But what is the use of those roads, Mr. Speaker, if they are going to be manned by kidnappers, by terrorists, by insurgents, by armed robbers? That is an issue we should look at, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I believe that the religious leaders and traditional leaders in this country have a major role to play. They have a major role to play. And it is by speaking out, by consistently speaking out, that uh, a message will be sent. Mr. Speaker, education is a passport to the future, and it is the most powerful weapon for change in any country, and also an important tool for nation building. Mr. Speaker, we have two options. It is very, very clear. Just two options. We can either sit and watch these out of school, out of school children of today. We can watch them become leaders of tomorrow, become doctors, engineers, lawyers, or we can watch them become kidnappers, armed robbers, terrorists, insurgents, and anything bad that you can think of. But Mr. Speaker, another thing that we should always remember is this house has the power of appropriation. It is our duty to allocate funds to the education sector. How much of the percentage of our budget goes into education. Mr. Speaker, there are countries that have laws that clearly specify that a certain Honourable member, please step back. Honourable. A certain percentage of that budget must go to education. Now, if this, is made, if this is made a law, Mr. Speaker, then no government can change it. If we allocate 10%, 20% to the funding of education, then any government that comes cannot change it. It is a standard. Mr. Speaker, I thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Honorable Minority Leader.